So how do you everyone and welcome to Texas A&M University SP student chapter R&D series. Uh, today we are having our weekly R&D session and for this week we have a special speaker and guest uh, who's uh, joining us from Aramco, Dr. Gang Han, and who will be delivering a presentation entitled Stress Sensitivity of Fractured Tight Reservoirs and Its Impact on Production. So before we start, uh, let me uh, begin with introducing our speaker. Uh, Dr. Gang Han works at the upstream of Aramco Americas. Uh, with 25 years of experience in rock mechanics and geomechanics, he focuses on technologies related to well productivity, reservoir performance, hydraulic fracturing, and well planning and construction. Uh, prior to joining uh, Aramco, Dr. Han worked offshore continental and unconventional reservoirs from Middle East, Gulf of Mexico, continental USA, North Sea, Southeast and East Asia, Australia, North and West Africa, and South America. As the president of ARMA, uh, Dr. Han works with the board members and constituents to provide a more technological, innovative, diverse, and transparent society, contributing to the net zero and low carbon era. With over 55 technical publications, he's regularly invited to give keynotes at professional meetings and societies, such as ARMA, SPE, AAPG. He is a leading author of the multidisciplinary book, Drilling in Extreme Environments, Penetration and Sampling on Earth and Other Planets. And Dr. Gang Han holds a PhD in, in Chemical Engineering from the University of Waterloo in Canada. So we are happy to have you with us, Dr. Uh, Han. Uh, before we start, this uh, presentation is going to be recorded. So if you need the recording, just send me a message or an email and I will share it with you. And also uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So if you want to ask questions, please feel free to keep them till the end or you can type them to the chat box. And now without any further ado, Dr. Han, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Kasi. Thank you, uh, SPE uh, chapter at Tamo, Texas AM for inviting me. Howdy. Uh, this uh, I'm blessed and honored to be here, and especially this is the beginning of the Chinese New Year, um, and a new, new Year as well. So Happy New Year to all of you! Um, I'm gonna wear two hats today. Uh, one is as a president of AMA. Uh, I might have a couple of slides, uh, two slides, uh, just uh, briefly update you what AMA is all about. Then the other hat, like Kasim said, I'm also uh, a petroleum engineer, engineer at uh, Aramco Americas. I will share with you today a study uh, that we did uh, recently about the stress dependent rock and uh, its impact on production. So first I will talk about uh, AMA. So if you allow me, I will share my screen. And uh, uh, Kasim, let me know if he, if if you can see this, okay? Yes, yes, I can. Is a prestation mode, okay? Yeah. Excellent. So, AMA is American Rock Mechanics Association. Um, uh, that's its full title. It's uh, developed from U.S. Uh, oops, sorry. From the U.S. National uh, Committee uh, for Rock Mechanics at National Academy of Sciences in 1995, uh, AMA's mission is pretty straightforward: to be the worldwide recognized representation of multidisciplinary rock mechanics advancements and applications to serve its members and the public. Uh, the uniqueness of AMA is uh, it is multidisciplinary across multi industries, uh, including petroleum, seawall, mining, uh, geothermal, and interdisciplinary. We have six technical committees on uh, hydraulic fracturing, induced seismicity, drilling, discrete fracture networks. On the ground, the storage and utilization, which also includes uh, CCUS and hydrogen, and eternally. At AMA, we have fellows, the highest technical recognition, 
uh, board members, future leaders, several uh, future leaders I see in today's uh, 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 Zoom meeting, uh, students, uh, technical com com uh, communities. So speaking of uh, students, 30% of our alma member are students. That's uh, who we are, very dynamic and energetic group. Uh, we have 17 student chapters. Uh, Texas AM is one of them. And we also have uh, 10 other uh, universities from North America, as well as from the seven global universities. The most recently, as a matter of fact, last week, uh, two weeks ago, we had uh, University uh, KFUPM, King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals in the Haram, uh, joined AMA as the, the newest student chapter and the first uh, Middle Eastern student chapter, as well as uh, KF uh, Cost. King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. So that's who we are, what we do. We facilitate technology exchanges through US Rock Mechanics and Geomechanics Symposium. This year gonna be held in Santa Fe 2022 in June. Uh, you are more than welcome to join us. We also uh, hold International Geomechanics Symposium, partner with uh, multi societies. This year going to be in Abu Dhabi uh, in November. We uh, held a specialized workshop, topical forum, online seminars, and the training courses. Uh, many of you are familiar and participate and contribute as well. Thank you. Uh, we support and encourage student and early, year, early career participations and the AMA issue awards in research, applied research, case history, um, master and a PhD synthesis, outstanding contribution and a distinguished service. Uh, we publish AMA letters, maintain AMA digital library at a page. So that is my head as AMA. You are, many of you are familiar with AMA. Uh, you are, Actually, thanks to your efforts, AMA is such an enjoyable uh, organization to be associated with. For those of you not familiar with, you are more than welcome to join us at this multidisciplinary uh, society. So that's the first uh, uh, part of my uh, head view. <laughs> And the second, I will share with you today's uh, technical talk, which is uh, about uh, stress sensitivity of uh, fractured tight reservoirs. And, uh, so, Kasim, can you see this uh, presentation slide title? Yes, yes, I can. Excellent. Thank you. So. With the other hat, uh, I've been studying uh, this phenomena. Many of you actually study this phenomena for a long time. It's no secret a rock is stress sensitive. However, for tight reservoir, what's special? That's the question we try to address. And more importantly, is how it affects the production that's a key question to answer. And uh, uh, so today I will first introduce what is rock stress sensitivity. Right? We're gonna look at a flow property, acoustical property, and the mechanical properties. Uh, we're going to review uh, what impact of stress sensitivity on production and EUR. Uh, we're going to look at a case study with uh, uh, an experimental test on a particular uh, tight uh, carbon rock. We look at the compaction of this rock with the increase of confining stress. 
from perspectives of mechanical behavior, which is stress strain curves, acoustic behavior, velocity profile, and a probability, which is flow properties of this rock test. Beyond that, we also look at the fractures. Okay, the fracture, there are two types of fractures. One is uh, tensile, which basically hydraulic fractures. Uh, the other is shear, uh, which mimic uh, the natural fractures. So eventually, all the study point in one direction is how to manage drawdown to improve your production, maximize your EUR. So that's ultimately the goal. We're going to share with you some interesting uh, field experience from uh, op many operators. In the end, give some conclusions. So what is rock stress sensitivity? Right. So as I mentioned, the rock is stress dependent. In this plot, this is a bucking rock, where when you increase the confining stress on the X axis, you have the volumetric strain on the Y axis, which basically porosity. The porosity decrease with increase of confining stress. Right. However, there is a acceleration at a certain point. Uh, probably I should, uh, Kasim, I assume you couldn't see my pointer, can you? Yes, yes, we can. You can, oh, thank you, this is good. So basically the porosity and permeability will decrease with confining stress. The range can be basically 100% in some other cases. That's amazing. Um, then acoustically, the rock, the velocity profile, which is plotted on the Y axis, will increase. That means acoustically, the wave will travel much faster with confining stress and until it reaches a plateau. Okay. And the Young's modular and Poisson's ratio, which is defined in this slope of the stress strain curve, on the different confining stresses different curve represents uh, different levels of confining stresses. Um, those slope actually become steeper, which means higher Young's modular as you are increasing the confining stress. So it's the strength. The anisotropy will reduce. I will share with you uh, the uh, example from the core test next. So some unconventional rocks are stress sensitive. With uh, even with rock strengths more than ten thousand psi, people normally say that unconventional rock is very strong. The strength value is very high. Ten thousand psi easy. However. With this high rock strength, they still stress sensitive. Why? Because unconventional rock has low modulars because of the keratin, clay, and carbonate minerals. Because of the high total organic content, because very often those unconventional reservoirs are overpressured. What that mean? Overpressure means you have less green green contacts develop in the diagenesis process. So that means it's more stress sensitive, more com compactionable, compressible. That's why high compressible matrix and the lower perm than the traditional rock. Okay, so that's the foundation of our study, the introduction stress sensitivity. How that relates to the production? The delta P is the drawdown. When you increase the drawdown, you increase the loading, which uh, uh, defined by this equation, and this coefficient in the middle is related to the rock. Okay. So with this increase of uh, uh, loading, what's going to happen to the rock is the probability 
will reduce, okay? and the fracture conductivity will uh, decrease uh, to the point that it loss uh, significantly uh, because of problem uh, embedment, crushing, and closure of the fractures. Uh, it can lead to fast migration and formation spoiling, uh, rock compaction, and all those uh, uh, effects on the rock. If you open the choke too much and the drawdown becomes too aggressive, then you will see, for example, in this veil, a uh, dramatic, when you change the choke, a dramatic reduction of production and uh, lead to loss, potential loss of EUR. Okay. So this is the example from high, highest veil, which is also overpressured reservoir. People realize this, people say this in the field, in their operations, what they do, right? The, the, through trial and errors, they propose this idea, so called manage the drawdown, not the aggressive drawdown, manage the drawdown. They saw tremendous benefits. Okay? For example, Devon, in Eagleford, they through 450 whales, they found that they achieved a 100% and 87% increase of 30-day and 60-day accumulated production through managing the drawdown. Shell found they can lift the UR by, by 38% in high end whale through managing the drawdown. And Murphy found uh, less liquid loading, no frac sand production, and 36 uplift in the EUR production from Montagny. Chevron found similar things in Permian. Um, they have less water and sand production. And the council in Utica found, uh, found out their well production rate is pretty good, 13 to 20 million scarf per day for a year and a 30% EUR lift. At WebPF in Wakamata found uh, that uh, they can lift their UR 20% uh, through managed drawdown. So the benefit is, is very clear, isn't it? So uh, people realize this, this is a significant issue I need to pay attention to. So fundamentally, we need to understand how the rock behave under the confining stress. So this test, is focusing on the unconventional rock, uh, tight, uh, uh, very tight, only 6% porosity. Uh, rock strength is 10,000 PSI, it's very high. And the mechanical flow acoustic properties will be measured and uh, showing in the next few slides. This is the, uh, the two uh, samples of this, uh, this rock. A quick Quick conclusion <laughs> throughout the high point is uh, uh, the rock, this rock has experienced tall collapse with 10,000 PSI rock strength. This rock has experienced tall collapse. The porosity reduced to 4.5% and the permeability of the matrix declined by 90% during this uh, uh, lab test. In another word, for the rock tested, 1% of porosity decline because of increasing confining stress has led to 90% of permeability loss. Isn't that amazing? Only 1% can make that much difference. So let's take a look at the mechanical behavior. We're gonna look at three properties, right? Mechanical, acoustic and flow properties during this uh, increasing of confining stress. Uh, we first look at a, a stress strain curve, mechanical behavior. The left is a typical stress strain curve where you load the rock, the rock will first compact, right? It's compacted to the point where it starts to dilate 
we call the dilation process. This volumetric dilation, uh, this uh, blue curve is volumetric string uh, has been clearly captured at the lab for this, uh, for this rock at 2000 PSI confining stress. Okay, so this is normal. This is perfectly normal. However, at the 4000 PSI confining stress, what happened to this rock? Again, this volumetric stream uh, plotted in the in the blue dash curve has never has never went to the dilation stage. It's constantly being compacted. That means the pole the pole space are collapsed in this rock. All right, so the left and the right is the same rock sample, 10,000 PSI UCS, but the right has been, has collapsed, no dilation. Acoustically, when you compact the rock, you close a lot of pore space and uh, uh, defects of uh, laminations or, or natural fractures. Therefore, the acoustic will pass through much faster with the increasing of confining stress. So the left, you see the acoustic velocity ring in the azimuth, different azimuth of this sample. At the 2000 confining stress, you develop, a, you measured a ring, a velocity ring as a cross section of this uh, rock sample. Uh, ideally, when you're increasing the confining stress, this ring will become bigger, become, become faster, right? That's expected, 4,000 PSI. However, when you keep increasing, for example, in this case, we reached all the way to 8,000 PSI confining stress. And instead of increasing, uh, increase of this velocity, now the velocity actually decrease, become slower. Something happened to this rock. It's no longer become tighter. It's actually, it's more difficult for the uh, acoustic waves to pass through. So what happened to this rock is because of the power collapse. Similarly, the previous uh, plug is a horizontal plug. We look at a vertical plug in this case, again, Right, 2000 PSI uh, confining stress and we lost this range supposed to increase if we increase to 4000 PSI confining stress, which is expected. However, as we keep increasing the confining stress, now, as you saw, the velocity is not the increase anymore. Something happened to this rock. Again, it's because of the power collapse of the rock sample. Now let's look at the flow properties. We, we saw power collapse in the mechanical, in the acoustical behavior of the rock. Now we look at uh, flow properties. On the Y axis is a permeability. Um, um, this, this bar basically describes the ratio of horizontal to vertical permeability. So basically permeability and its chubby. As you increase the confining stress, which is X axis, you expect a significant reduction of the permeability and its choppy. So this ratio become almost a single unit. So vertical and horizontal permeability are closer to each other, almost identical to each other as you increase the confining stress up to between 2000 and 3000 PSI, okay? This is a value that I'm gonna emphasize again. The two curves, the black is for vertical perm, the uh, red is for horizontal perm, clearly showed that the probability will decrease significantly or dramatically, if you will, with confining stress, and more importantly, as you see, for example, horizontal perm, it totally lost as the rock come closer to a critical stress, which is between 2000 and 3000 PSI. All right. So this, there is a distinguished, distinctive slope change in both horizontal and vertical perms 
around the same value, 2,300 PSI confining stress. So this confining stress is a magical. The rock just changed dramatically. All right. So that's what I call pore collapse phenomenon. This pore collapse in compaction. Why is that? The rock is very strong, can afford 10,000 PSI if you want to crush it, if you want to break it. And now with only 2,300 PSI confining, this rock, the pole start collapsing. What happened? This is a strange, is it? The fundamental reason lies in this plot. For the rock mechanics guy, you're all familiar with this, but for the non-rock mechanics folks, let me briefly uh, explain what this is about. This, there are two samples plotted in this chart. Uh, the black is a traditional sample, and the, black, the red is for the unconventional sample. And in the traditional uh, sandstone or traditional rock, what you expect is the rock strength, which defined by this uh, line called shear strength, uh, McCullough uh, shear uh, strength, as well as by a compaction cap. This compaction cap at the cross of zero shear stress is called uh, cap strength, it's compaction strength. It's the maximum uh, stress level the rock can afford before pore collapse. All right, this is a pore collapse strength, this value. You may notice there is another value, for example, in this case called the UCS, universal compressed sieve strength, which typically people call rock strength. All right, so in this case, for example, you have traditional rock, you have low uh, UCS rocks, uh, uh, unaxial compressive strength, and you have high compaction strength, okay, pore collapse strength. However, for unconventional rock, I'm sorry, before I move to the unconventional, you may ask what can happen if the rock experiences compaction failure. This is a conventional sandstone uh, from a deep water Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, it's totally crushed. So basically you lost all the pore species. It's not a single failure plane anymore. So what happened to the unconventional rock, which is defined by the red uh, envelope? You have shear strength in this, uh, in this street curve, and then you have compaction curve on top of it. Well, as you may notice, now the compaction strength, the pore collapse strength is much higher, much lower than the traditional one. However, it's UCS, Unexial Compressive Strength, is way higher than the typical rock, right? So this is a 10,000 PSI rock. However, with much smaller uh, strings for compaction. Why is this? This has everything to do with this friction angle. Friction angle defines how much friction force between the green green particles of the rock. So in the unconventional rock, because we tested in this experiment, because the high friction angle, even if, even though it has much higher uh, UCS, 10,000 PSI, it has much, it is very weak for compaction. So it's very easy to be compacted. So that's, uh, in the previous slide, I also uh, explain why this phenomenon happened because it has high friction angle, has uh, low uh, modulars, right? And it has the deformable, uh, more deformable green 
and a weak green green context. Fundamentally, this phenomena had everything to do with that. So after the failure, compaction failure, this is what the rock looked like for this unconventional sample. A trivia. This is not coincident. Arma logo. Many of you probably know, but some of you may, may not know where this logo come from. This logo come from this McCollum curve. So AMA is founded on top of McCollum curve. And this paper, this study has everything to do with the simple, but yet fundamental uh, physics we are talking about all the time. So that's four metrics, stress sensitive. Now we are dealing with fractures. Right, the two type of fracture, hydraulic fracture, which is tensile, natural fracture, which is uh, shear. So at the lab, what we did is we, we first created a uh, hydraulic fracture <laughs> through a Brazilian test. These two laminations on top of the bottom of the sample, actually, surprisingly, they stopped the induced fracture at the interface, at this uh, lamination or, 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 or natural fracture interface. So when the induced fracture propagate and intersect with the natural discontinuities, in this case, laminations, it has been stopped. We capture this phenomena in the lab by simple Brazilian test. And then we measure different confining stress uh, through uh, different uh, uh, levels, uh, increasing uh, of confining stress at different levels. For shear fracture, in order to create a shear, with shear is you have to have sleep. Okay, you have to sleep the rock at the interfaces. So we have to shear this rock sample through direct shear test, and then we apply different loading. Uh, confining stress uh, to the sample to study the shear fracture reaction to the confining stress. Okay. So this is a, 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 the sample we tested. What we have found out for tensile and shear fractures, reaction with uh, increase of confining stress, they actually behave quite differently. The results plotted on this uh, figure, the y-axis is permeability. The shear fracture is uh, indicated by the red curve and tensile fracture is the black curve. For unpropped tensile fractures, which is black curve, 90% of permeability is lost with only 4,000 PSI from 1,000 to 5,000 PSI confining stress increase, all right? And then shear fracture, however, are more resistant to the confining stress. It didn't lose 90%, it, it lost, it retained 30%, more than 30% of permeability after increase of five, uh, 4,000 PSI confining stress. Both shear, and tensile fractures share a critical confining stress level at 2,300 PSI, separating a rapid decline from steady, from steady uh, stage. So this 2,300 PSI is a magical number, is it? It's not only applied to the matrix, but now we, we saw the similar things in the uh, fracture as well. Um, the shear fracture apparently is more resistant uh, to the confining stress. Um, therefore, in the real production uh, field uh, scenario, I would expect the shear fracture will contribute more than the tensile fracture, which is hydraulic fracture. So this so-called stimulated reservoir volume, volume, the production, where the production comes from, um, actually, the shear fracture will become dominant 
in the production stage, especially as the production as the reservoir start depleting. All right. So shear fracture is a king in the long term production. What did those guys do? Actually, operator found this phenomena through uh, the field uh, evidence. They did all. They received a lot of benefit, tremendous benefit, actually. As a matter of fact, without being a rock mechanics guy, <laughs> uh, so what did they do? Here is the uh, the gold coin, if you will, uh, the magic uh, behind the those benefits. For example, Devon, right? So high frequency data production data helped them to achieve the best choke management. And the shale restricted the flow back and the Murphy uh, used the downhole choke. So most of the choke actually uh, uh, on the surface, but Murphy found out if you put choke a downhole, it can be managed much better than the surface. A Chevron, the drawdown rate, the limit to one PSI per hour to five PSI per hour. And the console uh, is 15 to 25 PSI per day, which roughly about one PSI uh, per hour. So similar to, to Chevron, but, and a VPF similarly, uh, they found the similarly uh, a, a quarter to two PSI per hour, uh, drawdown rate. And also they optimize the timing for choke change. What time you, you, you do the choke change, that's, that's also important. So those are the, all the best practices uh, that are available through trial and errors uh, from operators. So here are the concludes. The tested unconventional rock shows uh, a high risk of compaction failure and power collapse regardless of its high strength. Right. So we, we witnessed through acoustic, through mechanical behavior, through the uh, flow properties. Then for the tensile and the shear fractures, they also very uh, sensitive, highly sensitive to effective stress. In laminated rock, high probability uh, anisotropy, the horizontal and the vertical uh, probability uh, difference will disappear when the confining stress increase. So as you depleting the reservoir, the horizontal and the uh, vertical probability will come close closer to, to each other. Comparing to shear fractures, tensile fracture has a higher initial probability, but it declines much faster. And both tensile and shear fractures decline similarly with two distinct, distinct stages, a faster decline as the fracture close and then steady decline with collapsing uh, pulse. So shear fractures from slip lamination, bad implants, natural fractures and falls likely dominant long-term production, simply because they are very resistant, more resistant to confining stress than um, tensile fractures, hydraulic fractures. So rapid uh, initial rate decline can result from closure of shear and tensile fractures. Manage the drawdown is required, is actually required for stress sensitive unconventional reservoir, especially the vines overpressured. With that, I want to thank uh, uh, Texas AM SP chapter and as well as uh, Texas AM AMA chapter as well uh, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, many colleagues uh, for staying uh, so late, friends and colleagues. Um, staying so late um, for this presentation. Also, once uh, I want to acknowledge my company, Americo, uh, Aramco Americas, as well as Saudi Aramco. If you have any question, uh, whether uh, relates to AMA or relate to uh, this paper, uh, technical content, feel free uh, to send me email. I will share those slides. 
uh, a PDF file with cutscene afterwards, so that you can all have those uh, those files in the end. Uh, thank you again for for your attention. Now I'm open for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han, for the great presentation. So I think we got the question. So Colin here, I have a question. Um, very nice talk, by the way. Uh, thanks for sharing. Um, we often think of unconventional reservoirs. A good approximation is transverse isotropy with an axis of rotational symmetry perpendicular to the bedding. But you showed azimuthal anisotropy. So what's going on there? Do you have aligned fractures? Uh, yes, you are right, Colin. That's exactly the case. Um, uh, actually, it's quite common, right? So uh, the bedding planes, um, in this case, it's actually the bedding planes, not, not necessarily natural fractures, but um, uh, it's quite uniformly distributed along certain directions. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, Colin, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Why this 2,300 PSI occurred for both metrics and those laminations, permeability-wise? It seems that this both system share the same critical value to witness this dramatic change, the slope change. Oh, any, any thought, to Colin? Well, you study this more, more than I do, <laughs> so go ahead. To try and understand it, uh, we need to understand what the laminations are. Are they um, kerogen laminations? No, or... those are not the kerogen laminations. Those are laminations with probability, with okay. a pretty decent probability, actually. Okay. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, minerals, but uh, no, not many, not much kerogen. Oh, really? Okay. Because we normally have a, you know, kind of a, a model where uh, the uh, the pores in the in the clay are, are water saturated. Then the kerogen has hydrocarbon, and it's interconnected uh, kerogen that tends to produce the uh, the the permeability pathways. But I I don't know if that's the case in you, in your samples. Well said. It, 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 typical example is Marcellus, right? It's very mm. typical, uh, like a Terry Engado uh, uh, always. Uh, 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 I use word advertised <laughs> that uh, uh, the carrion uh, exploring theory will create a lot of uh, uh, laminations and natural fractures. But in this sample, uh, uh, we didn't see that. So that means probably different mechanisms uh, uh, during the lamination development. But do you see evidence of strain localization or is the compaction homogeneous? It's pretty ho homogeneous, uh, I have to say, because we did this 360 degree acoustic profile. So, uh, as musically, uh, in terms of uh, acoustic profile, is uh, as you see, it's, it has an elliptical shape, but relatively speaking, it maintained that shape throughout the test. So, so is the is, is the bedding the bedding uh, is parallel to the axis of the sample? Is that the way you have it? Uh, the bedding is pretty much uh, a horizontal bedding, and we tested both horizontal plugs and vertical plugs. Okay. In order to have this uh, this uh, ninety degree uh, perpendicular uh, sure. uh, sample test. So the vertical plug doesn't show an azimuthal anisotropy, is that right? And the horizontal does, or uh, both of them? Both of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting. Look forward to seeing the paper again. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, 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 indeed, uh, Colin. I, I, honestly speaking, I have been humbled by this study. Uh, before that, I have some perceptions myself. Um, but then after this study, as the study going on. My mind just keep uh, uh, being blown away <laughs> by what I have seen. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Na nature and especially geomechanics always humbles you. <laughs> yeah, always. Hum uh, thanks, thanks. Well said, uh, Colin. Yeah, well said. Thanks. Oh, I see uh, Carlos. Uh, uh, 
uh, comment in the uh, or compliment in the in the chat window. Thanks uh, from Venezuela. Uh, uh, good to uh, easy to understand. I think one thing, uh, Carlos, I learned after twenty five years in this industry is as a PhD, we all uh, have to find a way to effectively communicate with engineers, with uh, colleagues. Therefore, to pick up the right language in the most straightforward way uh, to communicate those uh, technical contents is, uh, is a life journey to learn <laughs> how to do that. But thank you for compliments. Any other question from the audience? Okay, so oh, we got a question. Yeah, I see a question uh, uh, from uh, Aishwari. Okay. Um, I have a general question. Do you could you add any insights on why do we see fracture swarm effect? Oh, you're talking about the, the hydraulic fracture test site uh, that you have multiple uh, hydraulic fracture or uh, fracture. Uh, not necessarily. I don't know if it's all hydraulic fracture or not, but the intersecting the available is that. Yes. Sir. Okay. Uh, yes. Like, uh, when why we see more number of fractures passing through the core we take than the number of perforations we make. Like, do you have any? Like, I just wanted to know why. If you can add some insights on that, it is helpful. Yeah, uh, Ashwari. Uh, why? Thanks for the question. This is a, a very actually. Uh, I have to say, people made a significant progress to interpret the this puzzle. That you, not only you wondering, uh, everybody wondering, uh, but a lot of efforts been put into it from modeling point of view, from physics point of view. Uh, most recently at uh, Ertech yesterday, people are still talking about it. So my interpretation is this: even if people have not found natural fractures, number one, if even if people have not found many natural fractures, uh, it doesn't mean they are not there. It is notoriously fractured for any rock. Um, every rock mechanics guy, a rock guy, we all appreciate um, the mother of nature, the natural fractures that created during the system. Okay, whether you can say it or not, that's a different story, but the fracture will be there. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the hydraulic fracture itself, especially at the near available reason where this uh, uh, call through project went through is very complex uh, 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 phenomenon, um, mainly because in the near available, everything changed. You have five years stress, but near available, a lot of changes. So that uh, you have clusters, you, inside each cluster, you have perforations. And then you have stage, you have three components, right? Land up for, for hundreds of hydraulic fractures to in this small segment of the veil. Uh, that phenomena to, to the day today, uh, it is almost impossible to model at detailed level. That's uh, also one of the restraints of the modeling too. So the phenomena uh, we observed, like the Colin said, we need We've been humbled again. <laughs> All the modelers be humbled again. <laughs> yes, go ahead. So we have a question from Tony. Um, oh. He's asking that 2300 PSI level, how does this vary with formation of different mineralogies and chemical contents? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tony, uh, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I would expect. This 2300 PSI chain will change with different rock. For the rock we tested, um, the sample we took all from the same segment. I wouldn't say they are, there are no way they are exactly the same, but uh, I would just, uh, I would be uh, from the same plug with uh, um, uh, different locations, but 
However, I would expect the sample, relatively speaking, the sample difference is small. Uh, however, having said that, for other uh, experiments I have done with other unconventional rocks, uh, I didn't see this phenomenon. So that means probably not only the value will change, but also in some cases, if you're not lucky enough, you may not able, even able to say it. But we, we, I, I just been lucky uh, to come across this. Okay, the question from uh, uh, Venkata, uh, Bala, uh, Kari. Um, so seems like all correlated near fracture compaction and stress effects based on drawdown strategy, subsurface real-time data for prediction, and the lower vari variance you are prediction of the veil. Yes, <laughs> I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> we got it. That's the beauty of geomechanics. I feel blessed not only working with such a, so many talented uh, geomechanics colleagues, but um, I feel tremendously blessed to be able to work on this discipline. Geomechanics always start with the geo, with the rock, right? It ends as a mechanics, which is engineering. So that's why geomechanics can connect geoscience and engineering. And the fact that from the reservoir to the production, to the uh, 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 UR. So everything are uh, correlated and connected. And that's why APG and ST merge together for it. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding, actually, <laughs> even though, uh, but nevertheless, well said, well said. I see Santosh, Santosh you have a question. Feel free. Uh, yes, Gong, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, first of all, I like the way you explain geo and mechanics. You know, people in my company call me a hybrid man. Hybrid <laughs> <Because> man. <laughs> I fall between the geology and engineering, right? So my question here is, uh, you know, interesting presentation and uh, very rich data set, by the way. Uh, so were you able to take all this discrete data points, the lab data points into a modeling perspective, which means the data into the engineering world, the reservoir engineering. Were you able to do anything on the reservoir engineering to understand the production differences uh, on, in the multi-world modeling world? That's a fantastic question, Santosh. Uh, Santosh is a, a geomechanics lead at the premier uh, group. And uh, I have to say, your, your question shows that you already think of next. Next is that how we capture in the modeling and help the field development. Uh, that part uh, probably we couldn't publish, but nevertheless, um, my thought is this: in the reservoir, based on my understanding so far, some portion of the rock will have this phenomena and make a difference in the well production. Some portion of the rock may not. We don't see this at all, this compassion failure. So how you be able to uh, detect which rock will likely have this phenomena, that by itself is uh, worth many papers, uh, uh, a lot of efforts. Then once you are able to uh, uh, predict whether the, this rock can, will go through this phenomena or not, that's when you correlate the probability decline curve with the uh, reservoir simulations. The current approach, honestly speaking, is not good. It's not good enough, in my view, in the reservoir simulations. Using one compaction table for all the rocks across the field, and that compaction label only address the elastic deformation of the rock, which right. not even close to Absolutely. what we are talking about today. Absolutely. You know, um, you know uh, in 2014, uh, I published a SPE paper, uh, not, you know, like this data rich, uh, exactly showing uh, the stress dependency on the rock mechanics and what is it impact on the fracture asymmetry and the corresponding well spacing sequencing, you know, so. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, I'd love, yeah. to, I'd love happy to, to receive a copy if you don't mind. Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. I would be happy to share. 
not this data rich, but we were able to show like when you ignore the change in the stress dependent rock mechanics, what happened to your well spacing, uh, when you include what is happening, you know, so how much underestimation of fracture asymmetry are we talking about here is very severe, right? <laughs> so this is a great talk. I really enjoyed Thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you, Santosh. Thank you. One, one last uh, uh, comment I need to uh, acknowledge. Uh, there might be some of my uh, 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 Aramco sponsored students uh, in today's uh, presentation in the audience as well. And a welcome, I forgot to mention that at the very beginning. Uh, welcome to this talk. I look forward uh, if, to meet you in person, uh, all of you actually in person in the near future. Perfect. So any other question from the audience before we end this presentation? I like to call uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, good uh, friend, Amy, uh, from Canada. I, I'm very surprised you don't have any question for me. This is not Amy I know. <laughs> but nevertheless, if we, that's fine. We can, we can uh, follow up through emails, Amy, uh, in Canada. Oh, Colin said, uh, uh, ask me if uh, any uh, publication. Yes, Colin, uh, in the uh, slides that you're going to receive, the PDF file, you're going to see a lot of reference in each of the, uh, 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 throughout of the slides. Uh, this talk is based on a paper at IPTC in the ground. Uh, uh, that paper reference is in the slide as well. Yes, you will you, you will be able to to look up on. Okay, perfect. So I think with this we can turn end for the presentation today. Uh, so I mean, saying that other people covered um, my question, I had questions. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Hein, for your time. We really appreciate it. It was a great presentation. So as Dr. Hein said, I will share with you the presentation. If, if you want also the recording, uh, I will also share it with you. And thank you all for coming. Uh, please join us next week. We are having two uh, events. Also, we are having a training with Schlumberger this uh, weekend. So this is for Tamil students. Uh, it's going to be online. So please join us. And thank you again. See you next week. Bye -bye. Thank you, uh, Kasim. Uh, thanks uh, to Tom as well. Please say hello for me. Sure. And uh, I certainly look forward to visiting uh, you and the faculties and the students uh, very soon. Okay. Perfect. Looking forward yeah. to Have a great evening. Stay safe. Uh, the cold front is coming. And uh, uh, stay dry, stay safe. Okay. Sure. You too. Okay. Yeah. Have a good Ciao. Night. Thank you all. Bye.